The cypress broke like a minaret and slept on the road upon its chapped shadow, dark, green, as it always has been. No one got hurt. The beagles sped over its branches. The dust blew into the windshields. The cypress broke, but the pigeon in a neighboring house didn't change its public nest. And two migrant birds hovered above the hem of the place and exchanged some symbols. And a woman said to her neighbor, say, did you see a storm? She said, no, and no bulldozer either. And the cypress broke. And those passing by the record said, maybe it got bored with being neglected or it grew old with the days. It is along like a giraffe and little in meaning like a dust broom and couldn't shade two lovers. And the boy said, I used to draw it perfectly. Its figure was easy to draw. And a girl said, the sky today is incomplete because the cypress broke. And a young man said, but the sky today is complete because the cypress broke. And I said to myself, neither mystery nor clarity, the cypress broke. And that is all. There it is. The cypress broke. This is a poem called The Cypress Broke by Mahmoud Darwish, a uh, famous uh, Arab-speaking poet. So we're going to have a reading of this also in the other language. Yes. So, before I introduce my guest. OK. I'm sorry, it's going to take me a minute. So this is uh, the poem that is titled as Sarwatun Kasarat by Mahmoud Darwish. As Sarwatun Kasarat Kamithanatin Wanamat fit Tariqi ala Takashu fi Zilliha Khadra adakinatan Kamahia Lam Yusab Ahadun Bisu Marat il Arabatu Musriatan ala Arsaniha Habbal Rubaru ala Zujaj السروة كسرت ولكن الحمامة لم تغير عشها العلنية في دار مجاورة وحلق طائران مهاجران على كفاف مكانها وتبادلا بعض الرموز وقالت امرأة لجارتها ترى شاهدت عاصفة قالت لا ولا جرافة والسروة كسرت وقال العابرون على الحطام لعلها سئمت من الإهمال أو هرمت من الأيام فهي طويلة كزرافة وقليلة المعنى كمكنسة الغبار ولا تظلل عاشقين وقال طفل كنت أرسمها بلا خطأ فإن قوامها سهل وقالت طفلة إن السماء اليوم ناقصة لأن السروة كسرت وقال فتى ولكن السماء اليوم كاملة لأن السروة كسرت وقلت أنا لنفسي لا غموض ولا وضوح السروة كسرت هذا كل ما في الأمر إن السروة كسرت Good evening, my name is Charles Carr and welcome to Philly Loves Poetry a collaborative program between the Moonstone Arts Center of Philadelphia and Philly Camp the focus of our program is to give our audience the experience of the rich culture of uh, poetry in the city of Philadelphia and to understand that there are many, many venues and ways that people come to love uh, poetry in the city of Philadelphia, uh, either by the presentation of special poetry events, and there are a lot that have gone on lately in celebration of Whitman's 200th birthday. Uh, there are poetry readings that special places like Fergie's Pub every Wednesday evening. Uh, there are poetry workshops that are offered to poets of all stages of development in all areas of the city. Uh, there are also poetry uh, books uh, that are published in Philadelphia, Moonstone being uh, a publisher of poetry books and poetry chapbooks. Uh, so on any given night or day in Philadelphia, there is somewhere 
that poetry is being performed uh, and for the enrichment of the, ci of the citizens of Philadelphia. So tonight we have a very special uh, program uh, which is a focus on uh, the poetry of the Middle East, Arabic poetry, and we have uh, two great guests, two Philadelphians, so these are treasures of Philadelphia poetry and culture. Uh, first to my right, uh, immediate right, is Huda Fakrenen. Uh, Huda is Assistant Professor of Arabic Literature at the University of Pennsylvania. Huda is the author of Metapoesis in the Arabic Tradition from Modernist to Mutathun, Mastathun, and Kunz translator of Lighthouse for the Drowning. Huda's translations of modern Arabic poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Banapal, World Literature Today, Nimrod, Arab Lit Quarterly, and Middle Eastern Literatures. Huda is currently completing a book project titled The Edge of Poetry, the Arabic Prose Poem as Theory and Practice. Well, welcome, Huda. Thank you. And to her right is uh, Ahmad Amala, her husband. Uh, Ahmad's first book of poems, Bitter English, will be out this September in the Phoenix Poetry Series from the University of Chicago Press. Hamad received the 2018 Edith Goldberg Paulson Memorial Prize for Creative Writing and a set of poems, Recourse, won the 2017 Blanche Colton Williams Fellowship. Some of Hamad's poems appeared in Jacket 2, Track 4, All Roads Will Lead You Home, Apiary, Supplement, Sand, Mission Quarterly Review, Making Mirrors, Writing, Writing, Writing by Refugees, and forthcoming in Birmingham Poetry Review. Ahmad holds a PhD in Arabic uh, literature from the Indiana University and an MFA in poetry from Hunter College. So welcome to you both. Thank and you. Thank uh, you. I'm gl glad that you uh, could make it. Um, so, uh, the first thing that I would like to ask, and I, I ask of what I call hyphenated poems in, in, in our country, those that, uh, that we refer to either as Irish American or Latin American uh, American poets, uh, that we have Lebanese American poets, we have Palestinian American poets. Uh, what, what is the difference, or is there a difference when one says, well, we are poets living in the United States, but we write in Arabic, and we translate our poems from Arabic into English. Is there a distinction, or is that something you know, kind of uh, minor? I can start. Yeah, please. There definitely is a, is a difference in the experience leading up to the poem, but I think, and maybe Ahmed will, will talk more from his experience as a poet, when it comes to writing the poem, every poet contends with the language he writes with, whether it's his native tongue or his acquired uh, language, second or third. At some point, poetry is, as Wallace Stevens, I think, would put it, an apprenticeship of unlearning, including unlearning language and rediscovering it as if for the first time. So poets who write in English, whether they're hyphenated or not, are owning the language as well. They're inserting, inserting their experiences, no matter how diverse, into the, the thinking process of English or French or whatever it is, the, the language that they, they write in. So I think we should approach their, their, their poetic product equally. We should consider it as English thinking in poetry even if the experiences, the life experiences are different. Mm -hmm. And this is a chance to to allow Arab to allow, allow English poetry to be really be diverse in mm -hmm. that sense, to, to include experiences that are different from each other, to have English poetries as opposed to one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I agree with that, and uh, maybe to uh, add to it. Uh, the concern of, of every uh, poet at the end of the day is to uh, produce a good poem. And uh, 
whether you happen to be coming from uh, a different background or you've lived here all your life, once you decide to use the English language uh, to write a, a, a poem, uh, I don't think these uh, hyphenated identities really matter or play into this uh, mm -hmm. process uh, at all. Uh, there are voices in every poet's head mm -hmm. that are being kind of used in the poem and some of these voices I guess are voices of a different language, a language of your, your uh, background as someone who didn't uh, live here for example all, all your life and that's why you kind of need to own that hyphen uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, right in a way uh, uh, that is true to those voices but true also to your experience uh, in, in, in the English language itself and how you experience the, the, the language itself. And uh, I think that's the most important thing. Uh, in, in a way, uh, all poetry kind of exists in, in the, uh, in the uh, undefined space. And if, if you can kind of write that poem into that hyphen, into that space, mm -hmm then I think you've, you've done your, your job because the poem doesn't belong to either. It belongs to poetry. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the concern. That's great. But there is, uh, there is the reality is, and, and even in the uh, study of the lead up to this and some of the background information, I you know, came upon several poets that are listed in the genre of that that had left their homeland, had been away for uh, almost from childhood, mm -hmm. okay? And had to leave, their families had to leave. Um, but nonetheless, they're drawn back. They're drawn back to the language, they're drawn back to the culture and the tradition as much as, you know, other, you know, uh, poets are. It's, it's like, uh, you just don't leave it as part of your consciousness. I mean, and how does that, how does that factor in? You know, I, I think it, it does factor. And I think, uh, of course, I still read uh, Arabic poetry and I still read Arabic. And uh, even though I, I, I write in English regularly right now, I feel I, I depend on, on, on these uh, essential voices that have kind of shaped my interest in Arabic poetry, in, in poetry in general, that were in Arabic, that happened uh -huh. to be uh, in Arabic. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I think, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, time uh, kind of existing in between uh, two languages <laughs> is uh, kind of the more difficult way of experiencing language mm -hmm. in general. And I think that's a good thing for, for poetry because uh, it, it can, it, as Huda said, it's this kind of pr process of unlearning and going back and forth between more than one language is, is that kind of process of constant unlearning that when, when you see these kind of words in front of you and when you're playing with these worlds, like there has to be kind of a sense of awe that I'm actually doing this. I'm mm. kind of playing with these, these words. And, and I think that, that, yeah. that helps, yes. And nostalgia is a very powerful thing. And it moves much of poetry in all traditions. I think this sense of loss and this, this longing to reclaim something that is lost. Mm -hmm. and I think in Arabic poetry especially, that this is the nucleus of the poem, of the archetypal Arabic poem, nostalgia, the this, this sense of, of wanting to go back to something that's unattainable. And I think that motivates many of the poets that you were mentioning to go back and reconnect and try to reclaim or salvage something from a first language or from a, a lost culture mm -hmm. and to bring it into their present moment. I think that's, a, that's a, an understandable urge or longing in, in in all experiences. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also the urge uh, of 
people, if they're open, that this is a pathway to, to knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. and through the, the, you know, through the gate of poetry. Mm -hmm. um, in the fact that we have so many so, uh, you know, languages translated into English that we can, whether it's Arabic or it's, uh, you know, French or Spanish or Portuguese, whatever, it gives us a pathway. It gives us a pathway into a, another world. Mm -hmm. And so how much of that world is stay, stays with you? I mean, I mean, in terms of your development as an artist, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, where where does that come from? Because I know that, at least in my reading, I think in conversations before, that there is a very much of a s tradition in Palestine of storytelling, even I guess down to the village level, that mm, there mm. are people that, I mean, that's kind of their their assignment or their job or their entitlement, and, and it's, so is that you know is that the roots of? You know, I. Th I really think that, uh, especially in, in Palestine, uh, the idea of, of telling the story and retelling that story is uh, very essential to the Palestinian situation uh, because Palestinians in, in general feel that, uh, you know, history has not been very kind to them. Mm -hmm. And the only uh, way to kind of reclaim that history is to tell these stories over and over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, that's why, uh, in, in general, uh, we had this great faith in, in the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish, because we felt uh, that this poet uh, is actually telling the, the Palestinian story uh, through a medium that kind of survives time. Uh, and I think, uh, I think al although, uh, although uh, Mahmoud Darwish was burdened by, by this, uh, he definitely benefited from it a lot at mm -hmm. the same time and, uh, and, and, and took it upon himself to speak for the Palestinians, but also to write poetry. And I think the tension between uh, his identification as a Palestinian uh, a poet uh, and his desire to kind of enter into the, the world of poetry, uh, the pure world of, of poetry, created a very interesting uh, phase in, in, in uh, Mahmoud Darwish's uh, poetic career, especially towards the end, where that, all of these tensions were playing in the poem in such a wonderful way uh, uh, that it produced such poems as uh, The Cypress Broke, mm -hmm. which are kind of a, a, a beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, kind of non-political, but political at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of symbolism, there's a lot of things going on that are not just kind of, you know, they're not straightforward, but they're, they're, they're more and more powerful, I mm -hmm. think, to the telling of the story of, of Palestine. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in Palestine and in Israel, uh, Palestinians are living, they're Palestinian Israelis, right? Uh, to what extent in the education system in, in Israel is there a recognition of uh, that tradition? I mean, for all, to all. I mean, not just to say, well, to or Palestinian students, or whatever that way it's categorized. What way is that is a bridge to this conversation, mm. you know, that seems not to be happening, or maybe it is happening. I don't know. I mean, we we in the United States don't really get that perspective. But what is it? I mean, in the educational system in a place like Israel, where you have a culture of Palestine, the right right, right there, infused in this country. Yeah. That's, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I probably can't uh, uh, answer it with, with certainty because I didn't study in uh, Israeli schools. I studied in, in Palestinian schools. Uh, but I think there, there was kind of, at a certain point, a, a controversy about uh, 
whether Israel is ready for the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish or, or, or right. not. And I think uh, they decided, they decided that they're not ready for the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish and that they didn't want to kind of incorporate that kind of poetry into the, the, the regular school curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean that Israelis are not aware of him. And that doesn't mean that Israeli poets are not aware of Mahmoud mm -hmm. Darwish. And that also doesn't mean that Mahmoud Darwish wasn't aware of Israeli poets and, and read Hebrew poetry. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, probably Mahmoud Darwish, he spoke perfect Hebrew, mm -hmm. and he, he was probably very, very well uh, aware of what was going on on the poetic scene in, uh, in Israel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, uh, that's all to his credit as a poet, because he really didn't shun anything. He, mm -hmm. he, he was interested in poetry wherever it, it existed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and but I don't uh, know if that answers the question, but... Yeah. It, it's a very tough question that you're asking, and it's yeah. uh, controversial, and, and you know, we're hyphenated people, as you mentioned, so <laughs> it's tricky for us to, to, to respond to questions like that, but the, the story of Israel-Palestine is a story of missed opportunities, and if you follow a little bit of the news, it just keeps getting darker and darker, and... Um, Yes, this is a bridge, definitely. The poetry of somebody like Mahmoud Darwish is a bridge towards light for Palestinians and Israelis that is not being supported. And uh, the pa Palestinians in Israel, you said they're Israelis. Maybe, maybe not. They're not really equal citizens, and that's part of the mm -hmm. huge problem of that, of that, that, that uh, hot topic there. Uh, to what Ahmed was saying, Mahmoud Darwish was in conversation with many Israeli poets. Uh, he's translated into Hebrew, and and now in Israel there is a movement and this uh, newborn awareness and activism among young Israeli Mizrahi poets who are of Arab origins who are trying to recla re reclaim their hyphenated existence mm -hmm. as Arab Jews whose languages are both Arabic and Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, a very interesting uh, anthology was published a few years ago in Israel called uh, Ithnan Stein II that included um, poetry by young Arab Israelis and Palestinians in Hebrew, Arabic, and everything was translated into the two languages and into English mm -hmm. as an attempt to, to showcase exactly what you were saying, that this is a place for everyone and this is a, a multicultural, multilingual place that can be for everyone. Uh, but sadly, the politics and the geography that politics writes is erasing that. Mm -hmm, and there's, mm -hmm. There should be resistance. And poetry, as you know very well from being in Philadelphia, is probably the most effective way of resisting mm -hmm. of, of, and of inviting people in. Mm -hmm. On the long run. In the long run, <laughs> yeah, you have to be patient and yeah. wise. Well, Darwish, uh, I, I read in, in an interview, said the following, or wrote the following, or said the following. We cannot be defined by our relationship, positive or negative, to Israel if we have our own identity. Uh, so, which, uh, and so, with the escalation in, uh, in Israel to to essentially eliminate Palestine, at least from where I see. That's mm -hmm. my, my uh, that's what I, you know, how does Palestinian culture continue to thrive? With difficulty. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, you're asking tough questions. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, the, the way that I see it, that it, it, it hasn't really been thriving. Uh, and uh, and you know I mean this 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 wave of uh, kind of the the right that is is uh, ne that is definitely in Israel with Netanyahu, but also uh, being emboldened by the support of this administration. Mm -hmm. uh, is is very scary, and it kind of puts uh, 
you know, uh, a lot of uh, big question marks about, about these, these issues that are kind of uh, there, but they're festering towards kind of becoming serious mm -hmm. uh, problems. And the Palestinian problem is, is definitely uh, there. Uh, the, the problem, the, I think the biggest problem is that there doesn't seem to be a way out, like the hope Mm -hmm. seems to be out of the, the question, especially on the Palestinian side, that, you know. But to take this back to, to, uh, to the quote, I think what, the, what the Darwish is addressing people here, I mean, by saying we are not, we're not supposed to be defined negatively or positively by our relationship to Israel, he's really talking to people here on this side of the ocean, people mm -hmm. who look at this uh, conflict from a distance and who who receive it translated in the media, mm -hmm. who only see rewritings of the story as opposed to what's on, uh, what's on the ground in the reality. So, and this, I I in a way, can be connected to, to what we do here. It's, it's an issue of, of how Arab culture, Arab poetry, Palestinian culture, Palestinian literature is represented for the reader here outside the Arab world. It's always represented, couched in, in the politics of the region, in hot topics, in the interests of the American public. Mm -hmm. And usually the poetry is, is not high on the list of the American public, poetry coming from that part of the world. So it ends up being misrepresented and manipulated to speak to interests here. Mm -hmm. So Mahmoud Darwish is, by saying that, he's saying that we don't need a, a headline to exist on your radar. Mm -hmm. We do have a, a poetry and a language that has a long history and a culture that can stand on its own without the need for some crisis for us to show up on your newsfeed. All right. Yeah. If, uh, if you were to make a list, a short list, of poets that you would want people to read, that would be in English, although they're Palestinian or <laughs> Lebanese or Iranian, whatever, who would they be? So, see, you've, you've uh, pl put your finger on, on the problem. They have to be translated. Mm -hmm. So again, we are, it's a, it's a slanted image of, of reality. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to think of who has made it, who has survived in mm -hmm. translation. This doesn't tell you who I think is really worthy of reading objectively, but who has been, who has caught the attention of some translator. There is a long list, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you're asking me, so my list will have to begin with the Muhdathun. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? You're gonna ask me who these are, and these are Abbasid poets who were writing from the 8th century to the 11th century. Mm -hmm. We'll get to them, right? Okay. So some uh, classical Arabic poetry has been translated. Most of these translations are in academic contexts and scholarly studies. But to give you some names from modern Arabic poets, and the modernist Arabic poetic movement began in the end of the 1940s. So you, we can na put on that list poets, the Iraqi poet Badr Sheikh al-Sayyab, one of the pioneers of the movement, along with uh, the Syrian poet Adunis, who's still alive uh, and very active and controversial. Um, Ahmed can add to the list as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, just from my background, uh, I, 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 I read everything, uh, starting from uh, pre-Islamic poetry. Uh, and uh, these are sort of like the seven most famous uh, pre-Islamic uh, uh, poems. They're called the Mu'allaqat. Uh, and uh, I lived listening to these and hearing these uh, when I was uh, a small boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of my family's way of uh, passing the time because we didn't really go to school that mm -hmm. much because mm -hmm. of the intifada and the mm -hmm. uprising and the political situation. Uh, and I just, I, just, I just loved the sound of it and I started kind of memorizing it uh, without uh, any effort. So uh, 
قف نبكي من ذكرى حبيب ومنزلي بسقط اللواء بين الدخول فحوملي That's the first line of the معلقة by Imr al-Qaif And I used to actually memorize the entire thing uh, to, to, to interrupt And, and that's, that's, yeah, that's one, one name yeah, uh, Imr al-Qaif But this collection, these are seven poems that are pre-Islamic They are available in many different versions mm -hmm. in English and as Ahmed was saying to many Arabs, whether they're professional readers of poetry or not, these are important sources of the language, of the culture, of what it is to be an Arab. You've probably m have memorized a few of these opening lines for sure. Uh, but to go back to my list of modern poets, okay. so Badr Shaykh Let's go back and forth. <laughs> I like that. Adunis, <laughs> the Syrian poet. And I'm going to read some uh, excerpts from an ongoing uh, project of translating selections by Salim Barakat, who's a Syrian Kurdish poet. Bassam Hajar is another very interesting poet. Mm -hmm. the, uh, Darwish brings him into that, mm -hmm. is inspired by him in the poem you read. Uh, Wadiya Saadi is another prose poet. So many of the poets on my mind are prose poets because I'm working on that book. Um, Muhammad al Maghout is another very interesting Syrian prose poet. And there's also, I will also read uh, uh, some examples from a poet called Jodat Fakhreddin, who, who's also my father and the author of Lighthouse uh -huh. for the Drowning. And he's one of a, he's part of a generation of poets who came onto the poetic scene in the 70s. And they wrote political poetry in the beginnings of their career because they lived during the Lebanese Civil War. Many of them were from the South, so South Lebanon and the conflict with Israel. But they all matured and you know, became more aware of their craft later in their, their careers. So Shaw Ibzaya would be another one. Muhammad Ali Shamsuddin would be another one. Uh, Abbas Baydoun would be another name to add to that list. Uh, there's the Bahraini poet uh, Qasim Haddad also, who's, who has adventures in different mediums, in painting, in theater, and mm -hmm. music as well. So it's a long list, really. Right, sure. I mean, I can take it back uh, to the to the classical uh, uh, names, and and these are the the, the poets that I uh, loved and, and 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 read constantly, and uh, some of the names I mentioned Umr al Qais, but uh, I also used to uh, read Bashar ibn Burd, uh, Abu Nuwas. Uh, and these are these are sort of Abbasid poets, uh, Abu Tamam. And there's also the great uh, Al Mutanabbi, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I think some of their poetry is 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 translated. Of course, it needs to be uh, translated better, yeah. and uh, yeah. that's that's the the challenge. But in general, that's the challenge of poetry: yeah. is how do you translate? experience, how do you translate lived experience into language? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, that kind of language needs to find some kind of language in the English where we can, we can fit it and, and translate it. And, and that's yet to happen, but I think it, it will happen uh, as long as there are people interested in, in doing mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So, you know, we can talk around poetry, but we want to hear poetry as because I think there's an abundance so will you share some, some of the things that you brought to read okay so uh, as you mentioned in your introduction I have this uh, volume of translated poetry uh, titled lighthouse for the drowning and this is a project that I worked with with a co-translator so my co-translator here was Jason Iwin he's an American poet and as we also were talking before the show, translation is, is a challenge. It's a, it's a fruitful challenge. Mm -hmm. And I, in my experience, it's best done with a friend. <laughs> so where, you, where it actually is a conversation with someone, someone checking your version and coming mm -hmm. up with their own version to challenge yours and to keep a space open for the, the presence or the silence of the original poem. So this is a poem by Jawdat Fakhreddin that's titled how long this day of mine. And thank you for asking me to read the Arabic. I'm not sure we're going to have time to read the Arabic, do you think? Let's see. But reading the Arabic of Darwish earlier, because uh, again, my introductions are long, but 
I think I feel I need to say this. We need to allow the Arabic, the original, to sit with us in the room, to be present, even though we're going to you know, distort it in, in attempts at translating it. So I will, I'll try to read this in Arabic and in English. How long this day of mine? Is it not shameful to outlive one's friends? Do the dead see, once they have settled in their death, what they have left behind on the road where they deserted us? I wonder, do they realize the loneliness of the road once they have left it? Do they laugh in their death at our struggling in the strait they have already crossed? Do they pity us when they look back at where we are? Do they rejoice in their hearts that they have made it? Oh, how beautiful death is if the dead look back at the loneliness of the road once they have settled. I look behind me at each day that passes I find it calm, composed, and free, staring at me with pity, neither bored nor lonely. This is how the day passes upon me. It survives and hands me coldly to another. Am I now in another? This is how the day passes without me and clears behind me. Oh, how short life is and how long this day of mine. ما أطول يومي هذا أليس مخجلا أن يعيش المرء أكثر من أصدقائه هل يرى الميتون إذا ما استقروا هنالك في موتهم ما تساقط منهم على الدرب تلك التي خلفونا عليها ترى هل يرون إلى وحشة الدرب من بعد ما, من بعد ما خبروها وهل يضحكون هنالك في موتهم من تخبطنا في المضيق الذي عبروه ترى يشفقون إذا نظروا حيث نحن وهل يفرحون بأنفسهم أن نجوا آه ما أجمل الموت لو نظر الميتون إلى وحشة الدرب من مستقر لهم كلما مر يوم نظرت ورائي فألفيته هادئا لا يخاف طليقا يحدق بي مشفقا دونما ضجر دونما وحشة هكذا ينقضي اليوم بي هو ينجو ويسلمني في برود إلى مثله هل أنا الآن في مثله؟ هكذا ينقضي اليوم دوني ويصفو ورائي ما أقصر الحياة وما أطول يومي هذا Should I should we do the back and forth? Can I just make an observation? How different it is in listening to the emotion of that poetry in English as opposed to, no, I, I don't understand Arabic. Yeah. But to me, it's like the experience of, of reading uh, poetry in Spanish. I, I have some facility in Spanish, but you know. Mm. Um, and I just like to read in Spanish, mm. just to hear the language, to hear, and I, I put them English, and I say, you know, when you hear it, on the other side when you hear it. The emotional level, as great as the translation, is so much different. Definitely. It, yeah, so. And there's music <coughs> in it. There's music, music in it. In it. Yeah. So this is a, a variation on the classical meters. We call it free verse in Arabic, but it does have a metrical consideration and rhyme. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, sound has meaning. Mm -hmm. There is meaning in sa pure sound, yeah. and that is a dimension of the, of the poem that is lost in translation. Yeah. We have to reconcile ourselves yeah. with that. Great, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it can be kind of, it can be an attempt to reproduce it, but d definitely it's, it's sort of a part of poetry exists kind of beside the semantic. Uh, and and uh, that's hard to recreate. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm going to read the, the title poem of, of my book which is called Bitter English. And it kind of hi highlights uh, this kind of uh, uh, tension uh, that I had to go, to go through uh, uh, in order to uh, adopt English as, as, a, as a language for, mm -hmm. for poetry, especially coming uh, from the background that I came from, where I always imagined myself writing in Arabic and uh, 
And I spent uh, most of my life writing in, in Arabic, and I knew uh, how to write uh, on Arabic meters, and I knew the music very well, and, uh, and uh, you know, letting that go in a way to, uh, to in order to write in English was, was a very difficult decision mm -hmm. uh, for me. So this is bitter English. That I own no one language cuts me through. That I find this English tongue I use day after day, boring, in construction, even in poetry, cuts me in the middle of sentiment and sentence. I do not understand this sound. I stumble as I say to myself, I will ignore these English words, empty today. I walk down the streets catching my hand in the air, greeting faces I know I don't know. As I walk these streets only owning past echoes, cutting through this language, this English tongue, I want to catch with my teeth, cuts me through, that I have to stack all my old and new passports on my writing, cuts me through. I go over my exits and entries for this citizenship, my first step I doubt to owning something of this sound. I owe everything to one place that owns me, not here, where what I owe I do not own, time and many years spared, because this English tongue cuts me through, because this English tongue owes me a language. Hmm. My turn? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'm a very dedicated daughter, as you see. <laughs> and I'm, I'm currently working on a second collection uh, selected from Jawad Fakhreddin's work, but this time in collaboration with Roger Allen, who taught at the University of Pennsylvania for many years. He's a professor of modern Arabic literature. And this is a poem titled, You. And the collection is coming out this summer under the title of The Sky That Denied Me from the University of Texas Press. I'll read the uh, English first. When others are effaced and I alone stand tall like a fresh poplar, when night descends like a membrane and my window sighs like a solitary star, when memories or hopes take me the river hails me beyond the garden. Secrets speak about me in the dark, and I spend the evening alone, resembled by songs that shine from far, far away. When I am on my own and poems come to me, leaning over me like shadows and the magic of their edges touches me, when this happens and more, you are here, and we are together, where there is a fresh poplar and a window where there are gardens with a river behind and night and secrets speaking of me in the dark. It is you then, nothing but. The Arabic? Yes. حين يندثر الآخرون وأشمخ وحدي كحور جديد حين ينسدل الليل مثل الشغاف وتشهق نفذتي مثل نجم فريد حين تخطفني الذكريات أو الأمنيات ويهتف بي هاتف النهر خلف الحدائق والسر ينطق بي في الظلام وأسهر وحدي وتشبهني الأغنيات التي التمعت في البعيد البعيد حين أخلو بنفسي وتأتي إلي القصائد تحنو علي كمثل الظلال ويلمسني سحر أطرافها حين يحدث هذا وأكثر منه تكونين أنت هنا ونكون معا حيث حور جديد ونافذة والحدائق من خلفها النهر والليل والسر ينطق بي في الظلام فأنت إذا ليس إلا Okay, so uh, I'll read this, uh, this poem called uh, house cleaning and uh, it's, a, it's a rather long poem but uh, let's do it <laughs> so it's, it's made of two sections one is called kitchen there's a lot to take cleaning a kitchen first of all there's the dead mouse or is it dead asleep no sound I make then 
banging around, no movement, nothing. And what is the best way to pick up dead things? Out of the window panes, father and son walking and talking, yes. There's a lot to take cleaning a kitchen and looking for the source. I open up cabinets filled with the things that look back. Funny old food, how old, how long ago. How many times did I bring the same thing, wrap the same wrap? Use the same old plastic hanging by the rotten kitchen door. Yes, same. We did it together at times. Always now is never. And my mother, my mother, my mother, she, wrapping everything. Wrapping everything, seeds and feeds, summa, many bags wrapped in bags, packed and stacked, one on top of the other, many more there wrapped over the years, forgotten, and opening up the abyss of a black trash bag, the cleaning starts small, small bags dropping into big bags, and the hand that handles hesitates. Two, garden. As I was raking dead leaves in my city garden in Philly, and upon finding the broken, tip of an iron tool used to pick the ground and dig out dirt, I realized I know nothing of the terminology for the things and tools of the earth. In this English tongue I use day after day, composing and raking leaves, I am what I am, a deserter of my own language, unsheathing the sword of otherness, it begins cutting, my disdain for the adoption and the pitiful thing adopted and the whip lashing out against the world. And how have you been doing this AM? Well, historically speaking, I've been part of the disadvantaged of the earth all my life. And for 17 years now, I've been bottling up selves and sticking plastic bottles in the best of American Frigidaires. Mm -hmm. My turn. Mm -hmm. So speaking of the, <coughs> of the disadvantaged of the mm -hmm. earth, this is a, a project that I am again working with, working on with Jason Iwin, my co-translator. And we're translating selections from Salim Barakat's entire poetic uh, works. Salim Barakat is a Syrian Kurdish poet who's lived in exile all of his life. He currently resides in Sweden. And he is probably one of the most difficult, daunting, uh, poets who write in Arabic. He insists on being a Kurd, so he's not an Arab, but he writes in Arabic and conquers Arabic and breaks it, subdues, subdues it, as he puts it. This is, this is an excerpt from a book-long poem called Syria that was published in 2015, and it, of course, talks about the catastrophe that's unfolding in Syria. And Salim Barakat is a novelist and a prose poet who was published over 49 books, I think, so far. But his poetry is prose. So there's no meter here, and it goes on and on. It's, every poem is, is, a, is a monster sometimes. But So I'll let the poem speak. Syria. Don't ask me to master discipline, to master precision, precision from now on. Don't ask me to master discipline, to master precision from now on. The stupefied heights have torn their vests and the stupefied lowlands like the stupid expanse are useless from now on. My knees gave out and the sky gave out. The sky will be fixed by the invaders, the defunct sky, the sky, that apron stained by the dribble of blood. This sky, the chant of madness, the nightingale, the dance of the nightingale on a dragon's tail, the sky, the jerking from one belief to another, no proof of the sky after this, no proof of a ladder to it, no ladder to descend from it to the human, O country. The fury of the country, O country. You are the bags in which the disappointed gathers his clothes, his tenacity, and the stolen throats of his children. Legitimacy auctions you off, certainty is auctioned off within you, you are the auction of shrines looted, graves looted, O country. A survey of property, 
a castle in ruins and invaders, invaders standing guard. No defeat, no victory, no path can return me to what I was. Not the good fathers, not the good lovers, not the good murderers, not the good dead, whom death continues to announce to us as prophets in the kingdoms of the dead. Not even they can return me to what I was. And the murdered, the murdered won't rise to a task after this. This is the harvest of, of labyrinths and the furnishings of the wind, cheap moons in the markets, the murdered and their goods displayed on the twilight benches, the manner of the dead and the legislations of the dead in organizing death like states. Oh, oh, what an inheritance of bewilderment's blessings you are, O oh country, my country, you, O oh country. You know, and, and just just to say something before I read, it's just, you know, this this I th this tension with with language, uh, the uh, Salim Barakat uh, exhibits, and I that I, I I have I think is 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 something that every poet has, uh, and uh, and uh, sometimes uh, it's it's essential to have this kind of tension with language, even if you. Uh, if you only speak one language and, and one tongue. Uh, so we're kind of fortunate, uh, or I'm fortunate, that mm -hmm. I have this, this tension <laughs> with, mm -hmm. with English. Uh, I think, you know, it, it f for a long time, I didn't know how to use it. But then, but then I, I started discovering a way into English because of this, this tension with it. Uh, and. Uh, it's good uh, sometimes to uh, treat words, as George Oppen said, as enemies. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's a love and hate uh, relationship. Anyhow, so this, this is an irrelevant uh, introduction to this uh, poem <laughs> that I'm going to be reading. And uh, I'm, I, I choose to read a, a, a prose poem or, or a prose piece that I have in, in my book. And it's called Grand. One, this is the world as we know it. Everything is big and grand and all-encompassing. How long have we been asleep? Some 40 years, they say? That's fine. We are awake at this dark moment, and there is nothing to be seen. Two, the numerous vehicles on the surface of the surface are moving up and down the block. People show pride, but at the early hours of dawn, we all yawn and try to control the drip escaping our nostrils in the cold. We've all heard about the word that started it all. We pass each other's facial gestures, mainly content, contentment and its opposite. Some people know more than others, and the few that know nothing are the lucky ones, unknown. Three, catch that sound. The imaginary voice shouts in the middle of the street as the sun begins setting its orange sails in the sky. Catch a glimpse of the other world, of the orange before they start taking the sky down. The people who know the, the secret recipe walk down the street hiding a hand in their pocket. They smile walking down. They bare their white teeth for everyone to marvel at the light and at the lies spreading over their faces like the hidden veins of vultures. Four, little steps are what they are, steps. We could all trip and tip the side of this boat toward drowning but we hold tight like birds clutching a branch with their claws in the cold. We shiver convulsively, looking less and less like birds. We have about five minutes left, so we can still do some more reading. I, I'll just respond to you. I mean, I, I've, I am English speaking, <laughs> and I have uh, you know, my challenges in English. Uh, I guess the challenge it was, is uh, it, between being simple 
and uh, what I call murdering your darlings. Mm. Those words that uh, you, you, you cast on poems that really don't belong there, or they belong there, you think they belong there, but they really don't. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a challenge for everybody, especially today because language, you know, English language is changing constantly, mm -hmm. and you know, it's showing up in poetry. But uh, and, and I think that's, that's a good thing for, for English. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, <coughs> that's why it has a lot of poetic capabilities, mm -hmm. because it is changing. Mm -hmm. If it was static, then I think that, that would be it. You want to read one, one more poem? Well, the one know? I had was a Darwish poem, so, and we read Darwish, so let Ahmed have the okay. final word. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll read this uh, poem, which is called Malmoom, and uh, it plays on, on a line uh, that I love in Arabic, uh, and I won't tell you the line. You have to buy the book and read the notes. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to say again the book that is coming out, the title of the book. Bitter, Bitter English. English. Bitter English from the University of Chicago Press. So this is Malmoum. Don't waste a line, your ink, or anything else. There's no room for all the thinking of you and others. On this page, you are you. You are not you, as one ancient poet put it for mouse to repeat after him for how many years? And there's the lookout for your spring, Abu Tammam. Your word is one with the world too often. You are the true discovery of exile. The self wanders and adopts you only to remain in you intact. Thank God there's still a possible thing. There is still the stone standing, brushing again and again against the accidents of the world, and there that word and the sound, its echo that keeps us all together and very much lonely. Wow. Well, I want to thank you both. This has been terrific. And it's, it, in an hour, we really uh, kind of flew by. We could do another program, and maybe we will. Because we I think it's a very big subject and a very important subject. Um, and it, it is a pathway for us for understanding mm -hmm. of that part of the world uh, where we daily get a different view, a different perspective, to, depending on which channel you turn to. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, I also wanted to uh, point out your, your book and um, remind our viewers of the title of it and how one could get that book. This, yeah, this one, The Light, yes. Lighthouse for the Drowning, uh -huh. Boa Edition. And it's published by? Boa Editions. Oh, Boa Edition, okay. Yes. And it's available how? Uh, online and on in uh, Amazon, you think? Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. Okay, yes. great. Yeah, and in, in the Penn Book Center. Too. In the Penn Book and Center. And the, yeah. the forthcoming okay. book, The Sky That Denied Me, will be out soon, but we're having a poetry reading at Fergie's Wonderful. on the 24th of July with Roger Allen. Great. Yes. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. It's been really enjoyable and great education. Uh, for me. Uh, so uh, I want to say once again is this is a great show that's brought to you by Moonstone but we need your support to continue to do not only this what we do in this program but what we do at Moonstone with readings and publishing etc. So if you want to find out a way to become involved you can just go to our website which is Moonstone Art Center org and find out what's going on and support us. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Thank you.